Zechariah 11. I've titled this, The Rejection of Christ Foretold. Because that's what's going on here. It's, um, well, I guess the last two chapters we looked at told us um, that Israel would be in trouble in the last days um, until the Messiah comes to rescue them and cleanse them and heal their unbelieving hearts. And we're watching that happen right now with our own eyes. There, there are a couple of, of, of trembling to the nations around them. Uh, many, many Jews in Israel have rejected Christ openly, um, and yet he's about to reveal himself to them as Savior and Lord of their lives. And so we looked at that in the last two chapters pretty strong. This chapter explains the nation's rejection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and how in the last days they'll accept a false Messiah, that's the Antichrist, who will also deceive the whole world. So here in this chapter, God presents through Zechariah three shepherds that we need to look at. We're going to look at three wailing shepherds, three crying shepherds, calling out falsely. And we're going to look at the true shepherd, Jesus Christ. And then we're going to look at the false shepherd, that's the Antichrist, the one who is about to reign over the whole earth under the, under the reign of Christ or in place of Christ. So this is where God speaks about the nation openly rejecting him and, and listening to false teaching. And this is what happens, really important to us as Christians. We, we're solid, we're walking with the Lord, everything seems to be fine. Then you, you find yourself just drifting away from the word of God. And when you do that, then you find other forms of entertainment, religious entertainment, to fill that void. And then you drift far away from him, and you realize one day, how did I get out here? And God's saying, you put yourself there. I didn't put you there. Now come back to me and walk with me and listen to my word and hear what I have to say. And, and he's going to do that in a powerful way during the tribulation, three and a half years into the great tribulation, to, to these Jews that are there, 144,000. God is going to reveal, Jesus will reveal himself to them, and they're going to see him as God, their Savior, the one they rejected, and they will never turn from him again. But there's going to be a time, we'll see when Christ walks on this earth, that they reject him. So let's look at three Three wailing shepherds, I guess you could say, here. Verses 1 through 3. He says, Open your doors, O Lebanon, that a fire may feed on your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen because of the glorious trees that have been destroyed. And wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the impenetrable forest has come down. There is the sound of the shepherd's wail, for their glory is ruined, there is the sound of a young lion's roar, for the pride of the Jordan is ruined. What do you see in this? Take your time and look at it. What God is doing here is speaking to three different wailing shepherds. The O Lebanon, O Cyprus, O Oaks of Bashan. And they come in in their pride to overrule the nation of Israel. And God just rebukes them straight out and openly for that, that uh, pride of, of laying. He says, open your doors, O Lebanon. And it literally means he's speaking to the false shepherds in that area of Lebanon. The gate of your power is your own personal purity. God's saying, you think the power behind you is of me. It's not. It's your own personal purity. You are your own power. You have no power to give anyone. You have no help you can give anyone because I am not the power behind who you are. He kind of calls him on that. And he says, so swing your gate wide, as in open your doors and let all the people in to come see your glory. But what you're going to find out, God says, is what I actually have for you. So open your doors wide and let everybody come in. But guess what? I will walk through those gates. Think of it this way. Open your temple gates, O priests of Jerusalem, and let all the poor and lowly come in for help. And I'm going to walk through those gates and I'm going to flip 
your tables over and take your money things and smash them on the ground and release the doves that you're selling for money in my name. Go ahead, open your doors wide. You think you're helping anybody? I will walk through those doors and I will lay it low. That's what he's saying here in a very strong way. He says that, a f that fire may feed on your cedars. It speaks of your own personal burning of pride will consume you. When I go through those gates and I flip your tables upside down, you're going to look at me with this pride. It's going to consume you. We need to get together and kill that man. It's going to take you captive. And God said, I'm, I'm proclaiming it right now so you can see it there. And then he says, well, O Cyprus, um, for the cedar has fallen. You know, then in Cyprus, he's speaking of the shepherds that come in with musical talents. He's saying, your musical instruments are your pride and they will be overthrown and destroyed. You think your own glory is your pride, he says to the first false shepherd. Well, you're dead wrong. You think you're helping anybody. I will come in there and, and flip your life upside down. And then the musicians are in there. Oh, you think you're all grand because you're a grand musician. I'm going to come in there and you watch what I'm going to do to your instruments. You, 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 it's not for my glory you're doing this. It's for your own personal glory. And that's what he's saying. You will be destroyed and overthrown. And then he says the, the crazy one, well, O Oaks of Bashan, um, and it speaks of the religious leaders who consider themselves strong and mighty and able to stand upon their own religious convictions. He's saying, you Oaks of Bashan, you stand before me. Think of it this way. Because when Jesus was on the cross, looking down at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders. It's recorded in Psalm 22. He looks down and he says, Well, O Oaks of Bashan, he says to the leadership, You're the Oaks of Bashan. You stand before me. You crucified me. You put me up on this thing and you think I'm dead. You think you've shut me down. Well, I've only just begun. So wail and cry and scream and mock me with your pride and contempt because I've only just begun to do what I'm going to do and what I came here for. I'm about to show you something in, in, a, in a powerful way. He says, you think that you can stand upon your own religious convictions that you won't stand too far when, you, when I look at you. You think you've done me in. You think you've put me down. You've, you've put me to death. And he says... For the impenetrable forest has come down. And it means your mighty standing will fall and turn upon your own head. This, you stand before me. This is Christ talking. You stand before me in your religious pride. And that religious pride will be your undoing. It will come down upon your own head. And you know what? It was the religious pride of the leaders of the nation of Israel that caused Titus to come in and annihilate Jerusalem and disperse the Jews out across the whole world because their religious pride began to mock and ridicule and curse against Rome. And Rome said, we're done with you. We're done with your pride and your contempt. And, and, and here's the Lord saying, you reject me. And you didn't just reject me, you crucified me, you killed me, and you mocked me when I was on that cross. And I had only come to save your souls. Well, your pride will be your undoing. And he says it in a, in a powerful way. He says in verse 3, there is the sound of the shepherd's wail. For their glory is ruin. There is the sound of the young lion's roar. For the pride of Jordan is ruin. So he says, there's the sound of the shepherd's wail. I mean, those who tend the flock, um, the wail means they always have something to say uh, of their own words. Listen to your shepherds. They love to talk about themselves. They love to use their own words. As a, as a shepherd, under shepherd, overseeing a flock, Whose word am I supposed to use? Here's God's word. What he's saying is, you don't use my word. You use your own word and you love it so. 
And your wailing is going to come to crying in that. And he says their glory is ruined. It means your highly manner will become burly. You're, you lift yourself up on high, but your face is going to be in the ground. And he makes it clear. And he says, the sound of the young lion's roar, the pride of the Jordan is ruined. The, the young lion's roar just simply means from within your walls, uh, they're going to hear a louder roar outside than they try to roar. There's going to be this back and forth going of roaring and roaring and shouting and screaming. He's saying, it's, you're, you're going to be ruined. You'll be screaming and roaring for help on the inside, and they'll be screaming and roaring for help on the outside, and it's going to get louder and louder and louder, and your destruction will come. And if you read about the fall of Jerusalem, when Titus came in, it, it was a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath, just like when Babylon came into Jerusalem and wiped it out. And he's, and he's telling them, this is what's going to happen. And he says, the pride of the Jordan is ruined. It means the, the, the majesty of the overflowing water of the Jordan will fade. It means even the Jordan in its flood stage will not be able to refresh you when this is done. You mock me, you, your contempt against me. You nailed me to the cross when I came to save you. And you stand there in your pride and you mock me. And he says, and you will be destroyed. And when you're destroyed, you will know it was your pride that destroyed you. And not even the Jordan in its flood stage will be able to refresh you. You think about the Jordan in its flood stage. I have a friend of mine that is an engineer and he was studying the Jordan crossing with Joshua. And he figured out that for them to cross the Jordan, they'd have to go uh, three feet apart. And I think it was, it was a thousand men, that's what Doug said. He figured out the distance three feet apart per person, and it was three and a half miles that they would cross. So as they, two and a half million people crossed the Jordan River, even probably more than that, um, They'd have to be abreast three feet apart to go three and a half miles and cross in one three and a half mile crossing. That's person after person after person to go through. And then he went back and saw that God stopped the waters three and a half miles before so they could cross. And it was like when you figure it out, you're like, well, you know, Lord, you're amazing. But the Jordan at its flood stage is unbelievably overflowing. Think of the West River in the last couple of days, right? Or your backyard. <laughs> Dam. Yep. If they open the Wall Mountain Dam, it takes three three hours for the water to get to Townsend Dam. Yeah. That's how long. It's and it's long. wide. And it's wide. Yeah. So he says, even the Jordan at its flood stage will not be able to bring refreshment to you. I will, you will be so devastated. This is where you're going. So he talks about three shepherds or three groups of leaders of the church that are overseeing the church that are not overseeing the church the way God wants or, or the, the Jews the way God wants. They're not using his word. They're using their own word. They're walking in their own pride and they're in contempt against Christ. And he says, you oaks of Bashan, yeah, you will, your own pride will be your undoing. And, and it's just, that's just the truth of what it is around the whole world today to every one of us. In, who are in Christ. It's our own pride that becomes our undoing. We start to believe it, and uh, it's not true in that. So then you get to verse 4, then 4, all the way down through 14, he talks about the true shepherd. So I'm going to break it down. I'll read down to verse 6. Thus says the Lord my God, pasture the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them slay them and go unpunished. And each of those who sells them says, Blessed be the Lord, for I have become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. But behold, I will cause the men to fall into each another's power and into the power of his king. And they will strike the land, and I will not deliver them from their power. Well, let's look at that right there. What do you see? That, what stands out to you in this? Yeah, he's going to take care of the false shepherds by bringing in the true shepherd. 
So when Christ came to this earth, he sought after the poor. He didn't see to seek after kings, right? Why? Because it was the poor and lowly he was going to. He says, thus says the Lord my God, pasture the flock doomed to slaughter. It means tend my collection of sheep and goats who are sentenced and condemned and have made the choice to become feed for men, slaughtered by men. Tend my sheep that have chosen to become slaughtered by men. Why? Because they trust in me. So pastor them, tend them, care for them, literally. The other ones, the false ones, they've rejected me from being Lord over them. So here, go to the poor and lowly because they will hold on to that. And he says, verse 5, those who buy them slay them and go unpunished. And each of those who sell them says, blessed be the Lord, for I have become rich. You know, so um, to those who buy them, uh, it means to, to erect, like to lift up, uh, to lay before the flock a, a vision, a monument to obtain, and then to, to buy them, create labor in the way that I will bring them there. Literally, you'll receive payment for what's been done. So he's telling them, um, there'll be those that will slay them. They'll drive them and force them against their own will. And so you go and care for them. So when Jesus came to the poor and lowly, he was coming to those who had been driven against their own will. You, you're lame, you don't come into the temple. You, you're a leper, where do lepers go? In the temple or in a leper colony? Yet God gave command to the nation of Israel for the cleansing of a leper. How come no lepers were cleansed other than the ones that came to Jesus? Because no Pharisee or religious leaders would ever touch a leper. And part of the cleansing was you touching a leper. And then taking that leper and going into his home and seeing his family and his home and to walk through that. And the only lepers that were ever cleansed were the ones that came to Jesus. And what did he do? He reached out and touched them, shocking death to everybody around him. And he's saying, you, you pasture my flock. You go to the broken ones, the poor ones, the lowly ones, the ones who have been driven against their will because they're trusting me. They're looking to me for hope. And they're not hearing uh, that from, from these false shepherds there. Um, the false shepherds, I've become rich off them, right? And he says, and their own shepherds have no pity on them. Uh, literally, um, the, their own shepherds will not acknowledge their offense. They won't make any acknowledgement that they are wrong in, in driving poor, broken people really away from God which is what they were doing. And he says, they become rich. They have no pity. Uh, means they stand before people and kneel to bless the Lord. And they say, Lord, because of you, I've accumulated much wealth, but they never show mercy to my children. And he calls them on it. Um, and God is saying here, to worship me is to, is to love my children. How many times have we heard that in the word? You say you love the Lord, but you don't love God's children, there's a problem there. Because to love him is to love his own. And, and that's why the commandment was given by Christ, to love one another. In verse 6, I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord, but behold, I will cause the men to fall into each another's power and to the power of his king, and they will strike the land, and I will not deliver them from their power. So what he's saying here is, he's, again, he's talking about 67 Rome coming in in 67 AD. General Titus comes in. So he's saying, my wrath will come upon them by the hand of their own people and by the hand of their own leaders and then by the hand of the kingdom that rules the earth. And the kingdom that rules the earth in 67 AD was Rome and God's saying, Pastor, my flock doomed for slaughter. So Jesus came onto this earth, and before he was crucified, he reached out to the broken, to the poor, and to the lowly that were doomed for slaughter. 
Because God already knew. They, he's got it written down here in Zechariah. They're doomed for slaughter. In 67 AD, Titus is coming in and wiping out the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So what did Jesus do? You, the, the leaders, you have the word of God. Listen to it. He went to the broken, the poor, and the lonely and offered them the love of God and they received it. And you know what? They got saved and were with the church and before 67 AD, like most of the church, were dispersed out. And Titus came in and annihilated, just like he said. He said, they'll come in. Um, your own people will be against you. The hand of your own leaders and the kingdom that rules the earth will come against you because you're destined for destruction. He's saying, you will not be delivered. And then he goes right into, in Christ, so I pastured, verse 7, I pastured the flock doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. And I took for myself two staffs, the one I called favor and the other I called union. So I pastured the flock. And then we'll just stop at seven. Read verse seven again and look at what that says. How does that break down? That's what Jesus did when he came. So he came, he tended God's flock. He tended the poor, the broken, and the lowly, right? And, and he, made, he tended those who chose to trust him. And because of that, he guided them in two different ways. With a shepherd's staff. One he called favor, the other he called union or unity. So favor and unity. It means beauty in bands. Really important. Favor implies the beauty that God's grace brings, means God's beauty to hold them. And then unity here, or union, implies the fellowship that God's grace brings. So God's fellowship keeps them. I'm going to say that again, real important. He guided them with his staff, two staffs that became one, favor and union. Favor is the beauty that God's grace brings. God's beauty holds us. We just sang about his beauty. His beauty holds us. And then union implies the fellowship, one another, that God's grace brings. So his fellowship then keeps us. Why do you think Satan wants you out of fellowship? Because if he can get you out of fellowship, you're alone somewhere else in the world. And today on social media, it's so prevalent out there, it's enormous. But you're out there in this world that doesn't even exist. And you're out of the fellowship of God's people and you start to doubt God's grace. You start to doubt, does he really love me? Does he really care about me? And God's saying, get back in the fellowship of my people where you belong under the teaching of my word. And hear over and over and over that Jesus came to lead us and guide us and direct us by favor and by unity. By the grace of God and his beauty that holds us and the fellowship that we have in him with one another that keeps us. You can't be encouraged when you're alone. But when you come into the fellowship of God's people, you can gain great encouragement from one another. And that's why Jesus gave the command, you'll know my disciples by their love for one another. That's what's going to set them apart. Not their personal purity like the Pharisees, not their religious stand like the Sadducees, not, not, not their pride and pomp and circumstance like the religious leaders in Israel. No, you're going to know them like the poor and lonely that are so different from each other, yet united together in the grace of God in Christ, and they form this union. All of a sudden, a brand new family I've been put into. The bride of Christ found a place where I really do belong, in the midst of God's people. And there he keeps me. He holds me. His beauty holds me. His, the fellowship we have in him keeps me. That's why it's so very important to stay connected in fellowship because Christ is the center of that. He's the head of the church. 
You know, what, on Sunday, what do we see about Thyatira? Who was the head of the church when, in the Thyatira era? Man. Christ was kind of put back in a storybook form. And, uh, oh, he's in the Bible. That's in Latin. Put it on the shelf. You don't know how to read it anyway. Go see the pope or go see the priest or go see the bishop or the cardinal. They know. They'll direct you. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where's Christ in this? He's on the shelf where he belongs. Keep him there. Like, no. He belongs out in the hearts of every person. And it's the united <laughs> fellowship. So during the church age of Thyatira, you know what they didn't have? Fellowship. And it really twisted people apart badly. And the next church age, and the next two church ages, we're going to start to see this uniting of fellowship come together. And we're going to see people get strong in Christ and start making decisions against a whole political religious system. Powerful there. But that's what he shows there in verse 7. And then in verse 8, Then I will annihilate the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul also was weary of me. The three shepherds in one month. Um, that's the three groups that we saw at the very beginning. He says, I'll wipe them out in one month. Um, it's pretty wild because the term here it means 30 years. Think of it that way, 30 time periods. But what he's saying is I will permanently remove 30 years of shepherding because these shepherds have rejected my grace They've rejected my flock. They've rejected my face. So I'll remove them and I'll wipe them out just like that. And God did that in a powerful way. Uh, and that yet in here in Christ, we still stand in him. In verse 9, then I said, I will not pasture you. This is to die. What is to die? Let it die. What is to be annihilated? Let it be annihilated. And let those who are left eat one another's flesh. Those are strong words right there. What stands out to you there? Don't repent and turn to me. Destruction is your deserve. You know? And he's saying if your desire is to run off to your own ruin, so be it. Go. You know? I'm not going to feed you anymore. You don't want my word. You don't want my nourishment. So go. Go your own way. And you'll find out real quick that uh, maybe your own, your, own, your own personal grace might hold you for a time, but it won't keep you. That's a guarantee. You only go so far, and then you'll be, you'll be broken down. That verse kind of, when we're standing before an unbeliever, and we know the words should come, but the Lord won't allow them to come. It's like you can't get the word out. Yeah. That verse right there seems encouraging to the heart of the After they're gone, the first thing that Satan does is jumps on your shoulders, you blew it. Yeah. You know, sometimes we're not meant. To well, we, we, yeah, we, we share. And there are times when God stirs you to, to be still, and you're still, you know, and then there's a time that He stirs you. Most of the time, what's happening when we're sharing like that? We're actually firstly developing trust. And as trust gets developed in a person, then, then God opens the door for us to begin to share in deeper ways in Christ and that. But a lot of times it's, a, it's, an, it's an issue of trust. And, and for the ones that are teaching falsely, God's saying, you want to go that way, have at it. But man, you're going to your own destruction. You know, don't go that way. You know, one thing God is as a gentleman, he won't force anybody He'll never force you to go to be in fellowship. He'll never force his grace upon you. He freely gives it, and he suggests greatly in his word that you walk in it. And the responsibility always comes back to each individual human heart. That's why sometimes when you see somebody drift away from the Lord and you try to get them back to the Lord, it breaks your heart when they don't get it. Because you, you love them and you care about them. And you're like, just come back to him. Trust him. He's right there. He never let you go. Ever. So turn back to him. I mean, what did God say to Jerusalem for 40 years with Jeremiah? 
What do you say with all the minor prophets? Just turn back to me. Turn back to me. No, we won't. I mean, insane, but that's never changed. It's never changed. He's talking about such desperation at the end, the ones that are left to eat each other's flesh. Yeah. Just desperation. You know, the frightening thing about that, too, is... Um, when you reject the word of God, all you have is your flesh. And so you're feeding off your own flesh, and then you start feeding off other people's flesh, and you just devour each other. I mean, Paul talked about that, not to do that. We're not to be devouring one another in that way. We're to be encouraging one another and building one another up in Christ, using the word of God to do that. And in verse 10, I took my staff favor and I cut it in pieces to break my covenant which I had made with all the peoples. Verse 11, so it was broken on that day and thus the afflicted of the flock who were watching me realized that it was the word of the Lord. What do you see in that? He's talking about the leadership of the nation of Israel. So he's saying, I break my covenant with the nation of Israel um, and it will turn out just like I warned you. So what you have here, God's talking about a dispersion of the nation of Israel going out into the world. And he's saying, just like I said you would, you will because you rejected me to be Lord over you. So off you go. And you know what? I have other sheep that are not of this pasture that will trust me and I'll build a nation out of them. And that nation actually will keep the Jews alive. These two verses are directed to the remnant that he's about to scatter. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're getting the realization that the word of God has just been open before us. Yep. You know, somehow that's going to come alive to them in the tribulation. They're going to see him. They're going to see favor. They're going to see union. And they're going to see all that they missed. They're going to look at the Gentile churches. It's all been recorded in history. So it's clear to see. And I don't doubt many of them have read history in that. You know. Um, and then 11 again. You know, So it was broken on that day. And thus the afflicted of the flock who were watching me. They realized it was the word of God. All right. So. The humble, and, and he's talking about that remnant that you talked about, Ernie, um, that are going to be saved in the end will look towards me in their day of distress and they'll realize it was the word of God. God said this. So someone in the last days, that's in the Jews during that tribulation time, is going to be reading the book of Zechariah and go, it's, it's you. We rejected you. In our pride and in our arrogance, the cows of Bashan were, was us. And we rejected you. You flipped the tables over. You tried to show us who you were. And then you gave yourself over. We gave you over to the Gentiles. And we watched for, the, for 2,000 years what you did to a people who didn't deserve your love. You poured it out on them freely. And you gave it to them simply by faith and trusting you. And they're going to see it. And they're going to go, that is, it's your word. You proclaimed this thousands of years ago. And we fell right trap into it because of our own pride. And the remnant of that, they'll see that in a powerful way. Verse 12, and I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weighed out, what does it say? 30 shekels of silver as my wages. I wonder who got... 30 shekels of silver to, to pay off. That's what Jesus was paid off with, right? And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. That's amazing because we know that those, that 30 pieces of silver that Judas got to betray Jesus with was thrown in the house of the Lord at the feet of the Pharisees. And they picked it up and said, we can't let blood money go back into the treasury. So they bought the potter's field with it. And he says it right here. So 
I threw it, I threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. The same thing, exactly. And, and it's an amazing thing that God says, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price which, which I was valued by them. And amazing. What will, you, what will you give me to turn him into you? How about 30 shekels of silver? Whoa, cha-ching, cha-ching. I'm retiring, man. What a time, what a day. And God says, what a magnificent price that you used to betray me. You know, it just proves that the wages of sin is death. And God makes it real clear. But that's exactly, he's talking about Christ. So they're going to look at this, especially this chapter in the last days, and someone's going to say, that's, this is Jesus Christ. Very clear. I mean, unbelievably clear. Verse 14, then I cut to, in pieces my second staff union to break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So the, the broken brotherhood that's broken is the binding of the nation of Israel. So not seeing the magnificent grace of God that we've been given through Jesus Christ our Lord, God says, then I break this union and that's when you're dispersed out into the world. He just makes it real clear. Christ comes. They reject him. It's all written right here. He's given over to the Gentiles and the Jews are dispersed into the world for 2,000 years years and for 2,000 years God kept a remnant alive that is an amazing testimony of God's faithfulness to his word to his promise to his covenant and to his people that's an amazing testimony of that and then during that time of the last days he's going to now verse 15 through 17 talk about the false shepherd and he says Take again for yourself the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm going to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for the perishing, who will not seek the scattered or heal the broken or sustain the one standing, but will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hoofs. And woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword will be on his arm and on his right eye. And his arm will be totally withered and his right eye will be blind. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the Antichrist. Absolutely. The one who comes in place of Christ. After the church is removed from the earth, there'll be one that will be raised up and he's going to come from Rome, that central city, the seven-hilled city, and he will have a throne already established, a religious political throne, and he'll reign and unite five major religions, all the main religions of the world, unite them together as one. And he'll bring a false peace to the earth, and he's known, he'll be known as, as the great man, of, you know, the great power of, of God, the, great, the Christ, he'll be known as. And yet he's a false Christ. And he comes in in that way. And he says, take again for yourself, all right? It just means, um, it, when he says, take again yourself, it's crazy wording there. It means repeat your trespass over and over and over. Um, he's talking about like prayers that are said over and over and over. Our oh, Father who art in heaven, hell be thy name, thy kingdom come. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thee. Just keep saying them over and over and over and over and over and over and you'll walk away clean. And he says, take again for yourself this, the, the equipment of the foolish shepherd. The term equipment means useless tools. The useless tools and the foolish shepherd is a useless associate. It means looking great, looking good, looking magnificent in the eyes of the flock, but producing nothing in the end, never moving on to maturity. You're the religious power of the world, but you don't have Christ. You're the religious power of the world, but you can't help anybody you're the religious power of the world you you've united the whole world together and god says and you've used useless tools and you're a useless associate that means you'll it'll never come to be with what you're saying it's going to come to be um 
And he says, for I'm going to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for the perishing. God's saying, and I will allow this false shepherd to be raised up. That means this false shepherd has a purpose during the tribulation time because he has to fulfill a role. What's the first vial that's broken in Revelation chapter 6? It's the very first vial is the Antichrist. The white horse, he comes running down. In fact, the word horse means hippo, means facade. The great white facade comes riding in to bring peace to the earth. So God saying, I'll raise, we saw this in Zechariah a few weeks back when God said, I allow a religious system that's going to be a false religious system to actually rule the whole world. I'll, I'll allow it to be because I have a purpose in it. And now he's saying this false shepherd, this foolish shepherd is, is going to be the head over it. And I will give him time to be raised up and, and he'll, shepherd, he'll be a, a shepherd in the land. So um, he, he'll be a friendship. So people will venerate him. They'll honor him in a way, but they'll never, he'll, they'll never know my son. They'll never know me. It's just a foolish thing. So, um, it's going to be a great religious establishment in my name, but never knowing me. That's what's going to be. And so he's, he says, that's what it is. And he says, and they will not, this is what they will not do, care for the perishing, seek the scattered, heal the broken, or sustain the one standing. If you know your history at all, go back to the time of the popes, during the time of Thyatira, that church age history, and Sardis is part of that too. Um, what the priests did not do was care for the perishing. What the bishops did not do is seek the scattered. What the cardinals did not do was heal the broken. And what the popes never did, sustain one standing. They were in this for gain of political power and money. They were not there for the people. And what did God say when he... He took Moses up to the mountain and he said, I'm going to show you a pattern of what I want built. This is how the tabernacle is going to be built. This is how the utensils are going to be. This is how the implements are going to be. And this is how the priest's clothing is going to be. And God says, I want the name of every tribe etched into the stones on his chest. Why did God say that? Because I want my people to constantly be on your heart. And then he had the names of each tribe etched into their shoulders. Because he said, I want my people to be constantly on your shoulders. I want you to carry the weight of them. I want, you to, I want them on your heart. I want you thinking about them. I want you caring for them. I want you seeking them, healing them, establishing them in me. And during this whole time, and we can look back historically and see that time of Thyatira, that he's talking directly about this, that they will not do this. And when you take, in the, in the last days, when this Antichrist comes in and reigns in power, and he unites all religions together, you know what they're not going to do? This. They're going to be so glorified in their own way. Oh, I can be a Muslim and love God. And Ernie, he can be a Buddhist and love God. And Carolyn, she can be a spiritual. She can love God and we can be united. And, and, and Carol, and she's a Christian and she loves God. And we unite here as one. And yet all around the world, you have broken, shattered people who desperately need hope. They desperately need Jesus Christ. They don't need the church. They don't need the leaders of the church. They need Jesus Christ. And so that's why we're called, as we're called today, to share the gospel with people. Because even during that tribulation time, the truth of God's word that we share with them will not return to God void. God has a bowl of prayers in heaven that are set apart for that time. And he will pour those prayers out onto the world. That's why it's so very important. Sometimes we can't do anything, can we? We try to help people. We do the best we can. But we can't change someone's mind. But we can get on our knees in our prayer closet and cry out to God who hears them. And that's his promise to us. He's saying in this, these worthless, this worthless shepherd, um, 
He will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hoofs. The term here, devour, means taste for his own glory. He says the flesh of the fat of the sheep. It speaks of gaining authority through rank. It's like a circular course around itself. Everything becomes centered around your personal lust for your own authority over a people, just like it was in the days of Egypt. So this false shepherd is going to have a personal lust of his own authority over people. Man, I love it when people bow down and venerate to me. I love that. That's going to be the attitude of this false shepherd, of this antichrist. And then he tear off their hoofs. And, and it's, the term hoof speaks of deliverance, like salvation deliverance. So he'll, he has no concern for them, and he tears in pieces their deliverance. So you go to be delivered. Some guy's demon-possessed, or some guy's broken and shattered with, with sickness, and he goes up to this Antichrist, to this great leader, or even the Pope today. If you ever watch recordings, people bow down before him that are sick, and they call him Holy Father. Holy Father, heal me. Holy Father, heal me. Holy Father, heal me. And they venerate all these prayers out and these prayers out. And, and he's saying, he doesn't care about you. He has no concern for your deliverance. If he did, he'd be on his face before you saying, trust Jesus Christ for your salvation. But that'll never come out of his mouth because he loves veneration and he loves to be honored because he loves himself. And that's what he says here. And he, and he says it in verse 17. He just connects it. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock the term woe means upon you will come calamity, distress, and affliction. That means it's coming and it will not fall short. Woe to you, you worthless shepherd. It means your fellowship of vanity, your friendship of pride. You're all about you. You have the position you have because you're all about you. He lets him know that. You leave the flock, you know, um, Woe to the worthless shepherd, the, the selfish shepherd who's all about himself, who loosens the roots of God's direction for God's people. Instead of teaching the word of God so God's people can have clear direction, you form some other kind of substitute and you teach that. Frightening. And yet we can look back, we see it with our own eyes. We look at certain religions today, you're like, why do you have another book besides the Bible? And why do you have people spend more time in there than you do here? And how come you have people read this Bible only to be trained to trip other believers who don't know the word? Why would you go down that road? Because you're all about you. This whole thing is based on pride and vanity. And he says, a sword will be on his arm and on his right eye. His arm will be totally withered. His right eye will be blind. So a sword on his arm and his right eye, it speaks of a destructive instrument of power and direction. God allows this guy to reign. He's going to reign over the whole world. He's going to unite all religions together. And he's going to put people to death who will not conform to his way. He's going to make a mark. And if you choose to not take my mark, you die. A sword on his right arm in his eye. He sees a power of destruction. He, he, he destroys the direction for God's children. And yet he has this power strip. And he's going to kill people. Because they won't conform to his image. And he says, but his arm, his right arm totally withered. His right eye is blind. So, but his power will become the cause of people to be ashamed, confused, and disappointed. So you think you're going to take this mark. Now we know according to the book of Revelation, anybody that takes that mark, how do they end up? Damned for hell. For all of eternity. Now so you take this mark with the thought behind you that it's going to be great, it's going to be grand. Look at the power this guy has over all religions. He's the one we follow. He's the one we trust. 
And you take the mark and you realize immediately you become ashamed, confused, and disappointed. You watch other people die. Maybe the people that you love that won't receive the mark. And you're not understanding what's going on here. And his right eye will be blind. It means the direction he gives, that he truly gives to people, will be weak and faint. They won't be able to see in the end. So he makes it real clear that I will, you know, you re to the nation of Israel, you rejected me. I came, I walked in your midst. I walked into the temple. You were, you were ripping off my people. I flipped over your tables. I tossed your money on the floor and you openly mocked me and ridiculed me and sought to kill me. And then you did kill me. And when I was on the cross dying, you mocked and spit at me. And you rejected me. And I was given over to the Gentiles to give them hope. And then in the end, in the last days, when I take my bride back to be with me, he says, I, I have allowed this false religious system to be on the earth. And from that religious system will come a man of power. His power's false. His words have no hope. Yet the world will flock to him. And he's saying, he's saying, but not you, my people. That remnant that I keep alive. I will reveal myself to you and show you who I am. So a powerful chapter of a picture of what's going to happen in the last days with the nation of Israel and the Antichrist and how that's all going to work out. And God doesn't mix words with what he says. But something that I took from this is really in sharing the gospel with the lost in this valley, from this chapter, what would, be, what would God call us on? Look at this chapter. We're not going to go through the tribulation. That's a guarantee. That's a blessing. We're going to go before that. But we're still here for a purpose and a reason. So what did the worthless shepherd not do? He didn't care for the perishing. He didn't seek the scattered. He didn't heal the broken. He didn't sustain the one standing. And this is our call. This is a call from God. We're called to care for the perishing. It means to be willing to bear the pain of those who wither and decay. When people are withering and decaying in front of you, and they're your brother or sister in the Lord, it's easy just to push them aside because you don't have time for that. And God's saying, but that's not the call. I've given you myself. I've given you the hope of heaven. So you know what? I want you to care for the perishing in this valley. Be willing to bear the pain of those who wither and decay. And then I want you to seek the scattered. It means literally strive after those that wander aimlessly. They're out there. They don't know where they're going. They're, they, they belong to him. He's not talking about the lost. He's talking about the saved. We're, we're called to share the gospel with the lost. But with the saved... You'll, you'll bump into somebody who's just out there aimlessly. They don't know where they're going. And you tell them, you're going to heaven. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He doesn't take that away. You belong to him. Now get back in fellowship where you belong. And walk with God's people, regardless of how you feel about yourself. Because God's got a promise here, and he doesn't break it. And then we're called to heal the broken. Now, it's a whole lot easier when we're in pain to say, but I'm broken, or but I'm scattered, or but I'm perishing. And God's saying, but you have all of me. So heal the broken literally means adore God over those who are crushed in their spirit. You love your Lord and adore him over those who are crushed in their spirit. Because when you're crushed in your spirit, you're not thinking of adoring God. You're broken. When you're broken, you're broken. I've been broken in my life. You didn't, I wasn't praising God when I was broken. I was broken. I remember being in such pain, I couldn't even walk. And my brother came over my house, because my wife had to go to work, and he, to wipe my butt. Because I couldn't do it. 
And I wasn't praising God at that time. I was in pain. And God got me through it, and I praised him after that. But there's a time that we're called to heal the broken in that, to love God enough to, to be over, to, to love and adore him over those who are crushed in spirit. And then to sustain the one standing. It means to make provision for the one who's already established. Maybe there's someone established in Christ and they just don't have what it takes. I know people that are, that, that are believers in Christ and they're established in their salvation in him, yet they don't know how to care for their budget. They don't know how to do it. So you help them. They don't know how to brush their teeth, so you help them. I remember teaching a young kid how to make a sandwich because he didn't know how to make one. Because he didn't know how. So you, you do that. So, so there's, a, there's a calling there that we're called to step into. And, and really, that's loving one another. So you go back to this false shepherd. The one thing he and his cardinals and his bishops and his priests will never do is love one another. And that's the only call, commandment, we've been given by Jesus Christ to love one another, to care enough that when someone's hurting that bad and they can't help themselves, that we do. And we press on in doing that each and every day. And it, and it may not be easy, but we have him and we have each other. We're called to walk that out. So strong chapter, but a very important one, because this is a prophetic word about the last days and the great tribulation time that's about to take place. And we're on the threshold of that, man. Amen. I always say it's, you know, the time clock is... is uh, 1159.9999999, but put on another 59s on that, and we're right there. And, and if anybody's going to be sharing the gospel or loving one another, we ought to be the people to be found to do it, because we know how it's going to be when, we, when we're gone. So we press on in that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to open up your word. Thank you for the grace and mercy you've given us to walk through it. And I pray that you take your word that was taught today, Lord, plant it deep in all of our hearts. Let it reveal Christ as Lord. Let it accompany the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And let it direct us to be the people you've called us to be in this valley. Lord, we love you. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.